Hey guys, welcome back. This is my new video on shooting. So today we have our shadow cap and we'll just see the record sheet right here. That way you guys can see what's going on. You'll see the walking, running, jumping there in the top left corner with the applicable modifiers for the pilot. And then you'll see under the weapons, the different ranges. You have the question mark under minimum range because that's an equation. Uh, it's a very short, simple equation. Uh, short, medium, and long, 0, 2, and 4. So that way you know what the modifiers are at a range. So anyone can just add this to their paper before they start if they're having any difficulty adding the numbers together. Next up, we don't want to forget our board right here. So this is going to have a bunch of the modifiers on it as well, or ranges and things like that. So in front of us, we have our shadow cat that we'll be using uh, to demonstrate all of this today. A Wolverine is our target. And then the commander in the back there, and the mad dog, just observing. So the next, next, um, next thing to cover is the dice. So the dice are the easiest way to, uh, to make sure that the modifiers are available. That way people aren't constantly asking each other across the table, what's that modifier, what that meant, what's that mix modifier, etc., etc. Because that could be just a mess uh, as everyone talks over each other. So the first method that I would recommend doing is using two dice especially if you're new to the game. The colors don't matter in this scenario. All that matters is the number on the die in the back affects the controlling player. The number on the die in the front affects the person targeting your mech. So, opponent, yours. Eventually, once you're comfortable with it, you can move to this method. This is where you use one die per movement type. So I typically use the yellow and green for the walking, the red and blue for the running, and a solid blue for jumping. So all I care about when I place a die down is the color. Because the color tells me what modifier I'm using because there's only three options. The opponent cares about the number on the die, and that's it. The color doesn't matter to them. This makes it nice because there's not as many dice on the table. And when you get to a lot of weapons, things like that, dice all over the place can just be a mess. So let's just go through a basic shot, uh, shot modifier de uh, declaration. So basically, let's just say I'm doing short range weapons. The shadow cat in this example is gonna be a three gunner. So we have a three gunner. Now we have the yellow die here, so that means he walked. And a walking, based on the record sheet we saw a moment ago, walking is just a plus one. So three, four. Now you'll see that we're only one, we're only two X's away. So you count one, two, and that's gonna be short range for the purpose of this example. So there's no range modifier, no terrain modifier, nothing. So three, four, and then the one over here makes five. So for any short range shots, the shadow cat would need a five. Now, just to get it out of the way, I'm gonna cover minimum range. It's much easier than it, than it seems at first. So, going back to the record sheet, you'll see the Gauss rifle there, the third, third item down on the weapons and equipment inventory. You'll see the Gauss rifle has a two hex minimum range. So, as we can see here, one, two. So, what that means is we are going to bring up the board with all the modifiers and such. And right here, we'll see the minimum range equation. So basically, it's minimum minus target range plus one. So in this example, we have a two minimum range, one, two. So it's two minus one, two equals zero. So two minus two equals zero, and it's just plus one. So we already know it's three, four, five plus one comes out to six. So for the short range weapons, the shadow cat would need five. For the Gauss rifle, you're looking at a six. Now let's say minimum range was five and the Wolverine is uh, two, X, two X's away. Just make the equation. Minimum range of five minus two equals three. So we have a three plus one. So a total of four. 
So for this example that doesn't apply to the mechs right now, you're looking at the plus 4. So it'd be 3, 4, 5, plus 4, needing a 9. So that's where minimum range comes in. You'll see that on some auto cannons, uh, long range missiles, things like that. So now I've covered the basics of how to figure out your shot. Just to recap one more time, we have your pilot, your modifier, range and terrain, and then the opponent's, uh, the target modifier. That's it. In this case, just I'm just gonna hammer it out one more time. Three, four, five, that's all you need for a short range shot. So let's now start getting into some other concepts such as line of sight. Can you even shoot the opposing target? So as you can see here, I have a variety of terrain set up so that way we can do some examples. Now let's look at this. The Shadowcat and Wolverine, they're on, the, on each side of a light woods. Can they see each other to shoot? Yes, they can. Over here, we'll see they have two light woods. Can they see each other to shoot? Yes. We see one heavy woods. Can they see each other to shoot? Yes. Now we get over here, three light woods in the way. Can they see each other to shoot? No. And the same exact thing applies over here with one light and one heavy. Can they see each other to shoot? No. So just to recap, three light woods or one heavy and one light woods blocks line of sight to a target. Let's take a look at the hill over here. In this scenario, you'll see oh, a little bit off the screen, a little bit off the screen there. In this scenario, what you'll see is the shadow cat up on the hill, looking down at the wolverine. Because the wolverine is adjacent to the hill, and the shadow cat is adjacent to the edge of the hill, they can shoot at each other. Now. If the shadow cat was over here because the battle mechs are two levels high the level two blocks line of sight they cannot shoot at each other over here on this back on this back uh, piece of the hill you'll see that the wolverine is adjacent to the level two and the shadow cat is on top of the level two because the Wolverine is adjacent to the level two, meaning the cliff is just as high as the Wolverine is, line of sight is blocked. Now, when it comes to hills, it can get a little tricky at times, but the base rules, are, the base total warfare rules are fairly straightforward. Now, we're gonna look at this example here with the, with the level one. In this example, we'll see that they both have level ones between them. Because they are both adjacent to level one, they would both receive a partial cover modifier. Now keep in mind, partial cover is only a plus one. Now you're not counting, now for the shadow cat shooting at the Wolverine, you're not counting both of these X's as plus ones. You're only counting the one directly in front because that's the one that's gonna give the Wolverine cover. Same applies to the shadow cap. Only the hex directly in front will provide cover. Now the way the total warfare rules work is if a unit is higher than the target, it negates the partial cover. So we'll see right there, the Wolverine's right up against the partial cover. Let's see the shadow cat's right here. Now similar to the tall hill, the shadow cat is one hex is two X's away from the Wolverine. However, because the Wolverine is only next to a level one hill, the shadow cat can see over the hill entirely, meaning that the Wolverine will not get a partial cover defensive modifier there. Partial cover is awesome because any shots to the legs just hit the hill. So we just got you just gotta be real careful of that. Because the shadow cat being fast mech could get up on the hill, could negate that attempt to take that cover. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at the woods. Now for woods, we'll be using this board right here to show what's going on. Light woods is a plus one if intervening hex. A plus one if target in light woods. Heavy woods is plus two. So very, very simple numbers, easy to keep track of, easy to memorize real quick. So let's go back to our first example over here. And we're just gonna go one by one. We're just gonna do the numbers so that way everyone can see what's going on. In fact, we'll change it up a little bit. And there we go. So we'll see here on the shadow cap, we have a blue die. And the Wolverine, we have a yellow die. So we're just going to calculate short range shots. I'm not listing off any specific weapons, anything like that. We're just figuring out short range shots. So we start off with the gunner, three. Now the blue, as I mentioned earlier, annotates jumping. Jumping is a plus three. And if you jump back to the record sheet, you'll see the three there. So we have three plus three is six. We have one light woods, so that's a plus one. So three, six, seven. And then over here, we just have the one on the die. So three, six, seven, eight. For a short range shot, just needs an eight. Let's just throw in the minimum range with the Gauss rifle. We know that the Gauss rifle is two, minimum range. So two, so one, two, minus two is zero plus one, we'll add that into the numbers. Three, six, seven, eight, nine. That's literally it. You're just adding numbers between one and three. So next up, we'll go ahead and utilize these two light woods. Let's make it so that the shadow cat ran this time. So running is plus two. So we'll start off with a gunner. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's an eight for a short range shot. And because the Wolverine is three hexes away, if we were to fire that Gauss rifle, we're looking at just a short range shot. Now we'll, we'll go over to the heavy woods. For this example, we'll keep the, the, the dice the same. So remember, heavy woods is plus two. So three, four, five, because the color is running. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then, just using the Gauss rifle as an example, two minus one, two equals zero plus one. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine be a nine for the Gauss rifle shot. So that's how you calculate your basics short range through some intervening terrain. Now, just like the light woods being plus one, partial cover is plus one. So in the event the mechs were on the other side here, just like the example earlier, it would just be the plus one. So we have three, Four, five, because it's red for running. Three, four, five, six, seven. So we need a seven for short range weapons to hit the Wolverine. Now we're gonna go ahead and add range in. So, So what we have here is a medium range shot. In this case, the Shadow Cat has medium lasers and that would be medium range. One, two, three, four, five, six. One more look at the record sheet. You'll see short range on the medium lasers is five. So that puts this Six hexes at medium range. Let's go through it. So we have three, 
four, five for running, six for the light woods in the way, three, four, five, six, medium range is plus two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and finally nine. So for a medium range shot, we're at nine. Let's go ahead and evaluate with the two light woods. Again, keeping the dice the same. Three, four, five for running. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then because the heavy woods is plus two, same exact thing. Medium range shot. And that's uh, that's what the number is going to be. So for new players, a question that comes up is, well, what if I'm within the light woods? What if I'm within the terrain? How does that apply? So let's go ahead and show that example here. Now, like I said earlier in the video, three light woods intervening, that's the key word, intervening, blocks line of sight. That does not include terrain you're standing in. So here we have the shadow cat in that first light woods. So the only intervening terrain are these two light woods, just like over here. So in this scenario, they may fire at each other. Now keep in mind, the difference is, is the shadow cat only has to add these two woods in, whereas the wolverine is gonna have to account for both woods, the woods the shadow cat's in, and whatever movement modifier would apply to the shadow cat. So we've been able to figure out most of the numbers so far. We know light woods is plus one, heavy woods is plus two. We know we add them up when they're at it, when they're together in, in the line of sight. And so let's go ahead and add in, and let's just mix some stuff up. So partial cover, we know that that's a plus one as well. We have the Wolverine over here. Shadow cat here. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's medium range shot again for those medium lasers. Let's add it all up together. So we have three, four, five. Remember that's for running. We don't care about the number on the die, we care about the color, meaning running. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight for the partial cover, nine, 10 for medium range, 11 for the one over there. So in this case, shots are gonna be a little bit harder, but they're energy weapons, so might as well throw the dice. You're certainly, if you're not gonna overheat, you're not gonna run ammo either. One question that has come up is uh, height, for example. Now, now the mech's way up there. Do you account for that height? Is, is the level's height, uh, those gonna count as hexes would? No, they are not. You could be up on a level six, and if you're adjacent to each other, it's still only one hex away, as far as shooting is concerned. Same idea, shooting downhill. Unless, uh, other, other than the partial cover, other than looking over partial cover, the shooting downhill does not convey any advantages at all. If anything, you're probably gonna skyline yourself and just get shot by a bunch of stuff if it has range. Another area to keep an eye on is heat. That can sneak up on people. I make sure when I'm, I have mechs that are overheating that I actually change the gunnery number or at least add the modifier to the gunnery number. That way it jots my memory when my mechs are getting hot. Because you know, you just don't wanna accidentally skip over that. You're hitting shots and then realize, oh wow, maybe I missed a few of those. You know, maybe a turn or later or so. Another area to keep in mind is going to be uh, prone. So prone provides some benefits and some, uh, some disadvantages. So let's use that Wolverine there, for example. Now, when you're looking at prone mechs, there's a couple things to consider. So we'll see here on the modifiers board that prone under the attacker modif movement modifier 
is plus two. So basically, what that means is if you are prone and you are shooting, just in the same way walking, running, and jumping affects you, being prone also affects you. You're adding that plus two for being prone. Now, it can be defensive in some ways, but it can also be a big negative. When receiving weapons fire, if, uh, if, if the shooting mech is adjacent, meaning right next to you, so like that, that is a minus two for the, shoot, for the mech shooting at you. If the mech's way over here, that could be a that's going to be a plus one to your defense. So it's actually a little bit of a benefit. You can also use going prone because you're going from a two level high mech to a one level high prone unit. You could use that to your advantage behind hill. Oh, the shadow cat can't see the Wolverine. He's Wolverine is the same height as the hill. Same way that the level two covered the Wolverine just earlier in the video. Lastly, let's go ahead and just do a long range, long range calculation, just so that way we cover all of our bases. So we'll keep the running die and we'll just uh, pretend that's long range. So long range is plus four, just like I showed you earlier in the video on the record sheet. We got a three gunner, three, Four, five for running, six, seven, and then for long range, plus four. So three, four, five, six, seven, plus four is 11, plus one is 12. It's just that easy. For that range, you're just adding the, adding the plus four rather than the plus two for medium or plus zero for short range. It's that simple. Three, four, five, six, seven, 11, 12. Jumping back to partial cover, depth one water also provides partial cover. Now what's nice about depth one water is it's partial cover from any direction. Doesn't matter if the other mech is higher up than you, doesn't matter where they're standing. If you're in depth one water, you receive partial cover. If it hits the water, if the shots hit the water, it just goes away. You don't take any damage. It's that plus one, now the only problem is, is if you fall in the water and have a bunch of open uh, open locations, then things break. Uh, it's a little more complex. You'll want to use the Total Warfare book to act or Battle Mech Manual to actually sort that situation out. Now the final part of the shooting phase is piloting skill rolls. So there's a couple different ways that that is handled. Under the base Total Warfare rules, every 20 points of damage or well, under the base total warfare rules, 420 points of damage, that is a plus one to your piloting skill. So in the case of the shadow cat here, we'll see we have a four for piloting skill. So basically if that shadow cat were to rack up 20 points of damage, it would wind up having to roll four plus one, five. Now on battle mech manual, and a lot of people like this rule, is stacking PSRs, piloting skill rolls. So in the event you take 20 points of damage, it's plus one. Take 40 points of damage, plus two. Every 20 points of damage is an additional one. So you get in those big games, two lances, where you got assault mechs blasting each other, you're hit, taking 80 points of damage per turn. That piloting skill roll is gonna go up. So let's say you take 80 points of damage. That's a plus four. Piloting skill rolls. So you need to roll an eight. So it can get pretty brutal when you're talking about big games and stacking piloting skill rolls. So what happens when a piloting skill roll happens? If you succeed, then your mech is still standing. You don't have anything to worry about. Let's say your mech falls. It happens to me a lot. I often joke that I've killed more of my own mechs than I've killed enemy mechs. So we'll see right here the facing after fall table. So basically you make your piloting skill roll. You need a five, you roll a three. 
Now we see what direction the mech falls. So you roll one die and you figure it out here. Now remember, when you fall, regardless of what whatever this says, you land or you're going to end up in the push-up position facing that direction. So let's say I rolled a three on the shadow cap. Shadow cat's right here. We'll do right there. Shadow cat's right there. I rolled a three. Three is two hex sides right. One, two. And he's going to fall on his right side. So he takes right side damage. He falls on his right side. But at the end of everything, he's giving me the push-up position facing that way. He's, this is his new firing arc. If, it, if this mech were not to do anything the next turn, movement-wise, this would be the firing arc. You'd have your regular firing arc, and then on the receiving end, you'd have the rear here, sides there, front there. And so it'd just be, like, just be like normal. Now keep in mind, you can't torso twist while prone. So that's important to know. You know, if you've lost your leg and you're just kind of scooting around trying to get a shot off. So, as we were, just, as we were talking about, two X sides right, right side. So, the Shadow Cat is a 45 ton mech. It's going to take five points of damage. So, basically, you just roll two dice, apply it to the right side, and you get your location that you hit. Hopefully it's not a headshot. Hopefully it's not a crit possible critical. After you've resolved where the location, where the damage is, then you move on to see if the pilot gets hurt. Keep in mind, when you're doing that damage, let's say the mech is an 80 tonner, takes eight points of damage. You're doing five point hits. So you'll do five points to one location and then three points to another location. If it's a 100 tonner, 10 points of damage, five to one location, five to another location. Once you've resolved actually taking damage to the mech, that's when you see if the pilot gets hurt. So what you're looking for is the same number that you failed on the piloting skill roll. If that number was eight, you're rolling for eight again. In the event you get it, nothing happens. Your pilot's good. In the event you do not get it, you're gonna see right here, it's taken consciousness. What I do is I normally slash out the one there and then you'd need to make a three. If you make that three, the pilot's still awake, nothing to worry about. You still try to get up, he's just a little hurt. When the mech fell down, his head got slammed against the side, against the wall. You know, he's just a little shaken up. You roll a snake eyes on that first one. Your mech is unconscious. You can't use it the next turn. The soonest that you can roll for consciousness is the end phase of the next turn. So that mech is just sitting there. You can get take a lot of fire. A lot of times people ask, well, what order do you shoot in? Uh, do you, is it based on who wins initiative? Things like that. Yes, under the base rules, the person that loses initiative should be declaring their shots first. And you guys alternate. That More often than not, that's not how it plays out. In a tournament setting, yes, that would probably be important. Things like that. In a pickup game setting, it does not go like that at all. There are some mechs that are math pasta. You got eight guns on it, all different ranges. You gotta figure out everything that's going on. You're just running the numbers. With the dice, what that allows you to do is if someone else has a complex mech to sort out, you can go through and you can count off all your numbers for the enemy mechs. You can figure out all your shots. By the time uh, someone's figuring out two complex mechs, you can have all eight of your mechs done if you're doing two lances that game. So the dice really help accelerate the gameplay. And as I mentioned, the shot declarations, the order that they're done, it doesn't necessarily matter because the shots are declared by everyone and then they are supposed to be rolled for. Now, you don't want to get into a situation where someone says, yeah, I'm firing this and this at this mech. And then... They roll, they miss both their shots, and they're like, well, I can take the heat, so I'll shoot this. No, that's not how it works. All the shots are declared, all the declarations are finalized, then all the mechs shoot. Like I said, in a tournament setting, that may make a difference, depending on who's firing what, 
someone may maybe getting shot by something they didn't realize were shooting at them or something or other, and that can make a big difference as to what's shooting where. But in a pickup game setting where you're not being super serious and trying to win at all costs, you just say, hey, I got I got my Shadow Cat shooting a Goss Rifle, two medium lasers over here, you got my Wolverine shooting over here with this, and that's going to work just fine. It's not super strict in a pickup game setting which or campaign setting, which is going to be the vast majority of games you're going to play for Battletech. There are some that may may not agree with that perspective, but the, my favorite part of the Battletech rule set, and this is why I think it's just the best rule set for tabletop wargaming, is all damage is simultaneous. Let's say uh, let's say the Shadow Cat shooting at the Wolverine, Wolverine shooting the Shadow Cat. Uh, the Wolverine's a variant with a heavy PPC. It blows off the arm with the Goss rifle on the Shadow Cat. Now, in your regular turn based or Gentleman's Warfare, as I refer it. Um, in your turn-based games, the Ghost Rifle Arm comes off, Shadow Cat can't use it. In Battletech, the Heavy PPC blew off the Ghost Rifle, but at the same time, that Ghost Slug is already fired and through the air at the Wolverine. Damage resolves all together. So, the PPC may take out the arm, but that Shadow Cat still gets the shot. You're not feeling like, I just lost this huge weapon. I didn't even get to use it this 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 turn. No. Battletech is simultaneous combat. So that's why it doesn't matter what order you roll your attacks in. Things like that. Uh, one important aspect is the simultaneous, simultaneous combat portion. You have to really understand that everything is hitting at the same time. So a unique scenario that could come up is you're hitting, you're hitting that right arm on that mech. You're doing, doing a bunch of damage. Let's say you hit with a weapon and you do a possible critical. You roll that 12. And that 12 is going to blow the arm off. See, critical hits can be pretty bad. So, here's that determining critical hits table. Basically, any time you hit the internal structure of a mech, there's going to be this, this area down here, Anytime you hit the internal structure, you get to roll for a possible critical. In the event you roll eight or better on the critical roll, you potentially, you're, you're gonna break something. So, as I mentioned, 12, arm blows off, or limb blows off in this, in this example. If there was still, if there is still you know, a couple couple dots left here, and you're hitting with, let's say, a wave of SRMs, and a couple SRMs hit these dots, even though you know the arm already blew off, the armor is still there for the purposes of this weapons phase. It means it's all hitting at the same time. It's all simultaneous. So it may almost feel like those shots are wasted. And they they kind of are, because if you already know the arm's already destroyed, it's like, ah, I wish they hit somewhere else. Now, critical hits can be pretty bad. There's a whole bunch of stuff that can go wrong. When you hit a when you hit an engine location, that's plus five heat this turn and any future turn. So if you were just right on that heat scale to where you're at zero heat, add another five to it. In the event that it hits a jump jet, disables the jump jet, hits the gyro, you're just looking at a horrible time trying to keep your mech standing at that point. There's a whole bunch of stuff that can go wrong. Definitely look through the critical hits uh, effects in Total Warfare and the Battle Mech Manual. There's a couple different ways to deal with critical hits. As you can see on the table there, some locations had the one to three. Some locations have the one to three and four to six. Some locations like the leg only have one through six down here. So the way critical hits work is, let's say you've rolled an eight. You get one critical hit in the arm. Now, there's a couple different ways people handle them because you'll see right here, there's not a full range of locations. And this is something to be clear about before the game starts, how you guys wanna handle it, so that way you're consistent. So we have one critical hit. You roll one die, one through three, four through six. 
Let's say you roll one through three. Now you roll one more die. You see what you hit. You know, shoulder and upper arm actuator. Those are going to make future shots very hard. You hit the Gauss rifle, that thing's going to blow up. These are the way Gauss rifles work. But keep in mind that it only takes out the location. And it disables the weapon. If you hit the Gauss rifle again in this example, it's not going to blow up again. It, but it can still absorb the critical hit because there's, there's still other components of the weapon there, even though it detonated and it's no longer useful for the pilot. Now let's say you rolled four through six rather than one through three. There's only two locations. Let's say you let's say you go the method of re-roll both dice. You keep rolling four through six, four through six, four through six. You just cannot get off of it. You're never hitting one or two, whatever it goes. You can just flip over to this to this method. You roll one die, one through three hits one, four through six it hits two. You know, there, there's there's ways of getting around it. It doesn't have to be four through six, you have to roll one or two. And that's rigid, the only way it works. You can just make, you can just streamline it. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a bummer because it's a Gauss rifle, but you know, gotta, gotta get the hits in there somewhere. Since we're now talking about criticals, that also plays into the piloting skill role. So let's take it, let's use the example of, we took a gyro hit. One of the worst ones that can happen. So we'll see right here the piloting skill roll table. Under the gyro hit, that's a plus three. So the way all this math works out, and just a reminder, we have a four pilot here. The way all this works out is you have your four pilot, and then you let's say you took that 20 points of damage. Four plus one is five, plus three equals eight. But that's not it, right? There, that's not that's not all there is to it. You have to make a piloting skill roll for the damage dealt, and you also have to make a piloting skill roll for the gyro hit. So you have to make that eight twice. Let's say you took a gyro hit and a leg actuator hit. You add them all up together, and you have to roll one for the damage, one for the gyro, one for the actuator hit. Because you got you got three things going wrong there. You're just getting hosed down with damage. You got a gyro that's all messed up and your foot's not working right. You gotta roll it all together. You gotta make you have to make three different rolls trying to hit that number. And then unfortunately, if you fall, you gotta go through the process of take the damage to the mech, see if the pilot gets hurt. Because what's nice about the pilot roll at least is you only have to make the one because you just have the one pilot getting shaken up in there. So you make the one roll for the pilot, if the pilot gets hit, you gotta deal with that consciousness roll. If not, then pilot's good to go. And with that, I think I've thoroughly covered uh, shooting. You know, we have the actual declarations. You say, hey, I'm shooting this, this, and this at this mech. I need these numbers. Then you have the actual rolling for the attacks. Then you have the resolution uh, steps where you're actually seeing how much damage was done. And for that part, I always like to use kind of, kind of this empty space up here. I like to write down all the shots that come in. That way there's no question as to maybe he hit 20, maybe he's only at 18. No, we know for sure what number we're at. There's none of that maybe, maybe or if that. So you're gonna take that damage, you're gonna resolve any piloting skill rolls. If the internal components got hit, it's all gonna be adjusted there. It may seem like a lot, but it's it's a very simple pattern. You know, like I said, gunner the modifier for whatever movement speed you did, range terrain, target modifier. When you're figuring out a piloting skill roll, it's your pilot plus whatever, if you are just doing the base rolls and you took 20 points of damage, it's four plus one. And then in the event, an internal, internal component like the gyro or the, or leg actuator or something gets hit, you just add the numbers here. Just keep in mind, if a gyro gets hit and you take that 20 points of damage, you got to roll twice, one for each. If you have any questions, definitely ask them below. Uh, I'm also going to make a more streamlined version of this video, so that way it's a little, a little easier. It's just going to be the very basic, you know, your basic shots. Um, but if you have questions, ask them below. I always appreciate any likes and subscribes. 
Also, uh, be sure to check out my Resurgence storyline where Word of Blake makes a pretty, pretty nasty comeback. Uh, right now, as of making this video, I'm ending Act 1, and I'll be getting prepared to go into Act 2 in the coming months. Uh, lots of cool stuff going on there. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later.